From the Vehicle Assembly Building, the VAB here in Cape Canaveral, we bring you Rocket Talk, all things happening in space. So glad to have you with us alongside NASA's John Coward. Right. I'm Bernie Gunther. This is a special building built in 1966. So many great moments in rocketry have happened right behind us. Yes, it is the iconic structure out here in Kennedy Space Center. You see it for miles around. It dominates the landscape and it's uh, ridden through a hurricane or two out here. So it's, uh, it's definitely important to us and everything that it's done for us over the years. Well, and this building is spectacular because this is the world's largest one-story building. Uh, what makes it so dynamic? It's uh, 525 feet tall. In the top of it, we have a couple of huge cranes that are capable of lifting 325 tons, and they can move that amount of weight up and down, left and right, forwards and backwards, in increments of 1 64th of an inch. We have to be able to do that in order to make all the components of first the Apollo Saturn V back in the day and then the space shuttle and pretty soon coming up the SLS. Okay, one of the things that I've heard, this building is so big that it, it could generate rain clouds? Is, th is there any truth to that? <laughs> that is one of our greatest myths we have out here, Bernie. Uh, you don't actually form weather inside the VAB, but you could be fooled into believing that because on particularly hot and humid days, you can get on the beams up in the very, very top, you can get some condensate from the very humid weather we have down here, and that condensate will drip down and people have thought it was raining inside the VAB. And you talked about the SLS, that's gonna be one of the iconic moments of the, the next generation of space travel. What is it gonna be like when they start to put the SLS together right here behind us in the VAB? I can only imagine. I didn't get to see a Saturn V get stacked in here. I saw literally a hundred space shuttles get stacked inside this building. But the, the Saturn V and now the SLS tower hugely above a, a space shuttle. When they start stacking that thing, they're going to put those two big boosters down first and then start stacking the core stages. It is going to be a very, very impressive sight. And just wait until they open the doors and roll that beast out to the launch pad. It's something you'll never forget if you see it. Well, there's tons of fun facts about the VAB, and for more on that, here's Savannah Collins. I'm in front of one of NASA's most iconic facilities, the Vehicle Assembly Building, better known as the VAB. It's the largest one-story building in the world, and not only is the building huge, but so is everything on it. The stars are six feet in diameter, taller than me. And if you wanted to get in a game of hoops, you could play just in the field of stars. It's the size of a regulation basketball court. The stripes could hold a busload of people. No, literally, they are nine feet wide, just as wide as the tour buses that escort guests around Kennedy Space Center. So this is how big the flag and logo on the side is. Just how big is the VAB? Well, try this on for size. A typical space shuttle inside the VAB is around 184 feet which is comparable to the Leaning Tower of Pisa in Italy. For Americans, think about the size of the U.S. Capitol Building or Statue of Liberty. Big Ben and London tops all of those. And the VAB had to be bigger than the Apollo Saturn V rocket. And even that is smaller than the London Eye and Pyramid of Pisa. The only thing that comes close to being as tall as the VAB isn't even real. The VAB, in all its glory, stands above them all at 525 feet. Well, so many fun facts there from Savannah and uh, the construction workers at the very end. Uh, I understand they signed the very last beam that was installed inside the VAB? Yeah, the very last huge I-beam. This, this thing is monstrous in the very top of the VAB back there. All the construction workers who were available that day, they came out and they signed it. And, and I have actually been up there and seen the beam that they all signed. There's just hardly any spot left for anybody to sign. And I'm told that this building is so enormous that uh, even going into the front part of it, some people are, are just baffled by how big it is and they haven't even realized the enormity of it all. So as you look at it behind us, you can see the very front part, that's called the low bay. And during the Apollo era, we would do stuff with the third stage and, and some other small components. But when you bring people in there, they look up at, at, the, at the low bay and they're just amazed at how high it is. And then you walk another 200 feet down the road there and you look up and now it's 525 feet up and they are even more stunned than they were to begin with. And it isn't it interesting to think about the, the foresight that the, the workers, the architects had back in a building that was built in 1966, that even in the next generation, 2020 onward, it's going to support the next generation? It is. It's an amazingly adaptive building. When we first built it, we have four high bays inside VAB right now. 
We've used three of them, but really only two of them for 99% of the stuff we've done. Only once has a vehicle rolled out of the VAB from the other side, that west side you see over there. Every other time, they all went out the east side, heading out towards the launch pad out there. This building has, has served us very well and will continue to do that into the future with SLS. And one of the incredible things is there's two cranes inside that they use to build the space shuttle, build the next generation of rockets, and those guys are super precise from what I understand. They are very precise, and, and I had heard this story for years before I actually saw them. We had, we had a family day out here, and what they actually did is they put 325 tons on the hook. They set one of those, those orange cones down there, and they set an egg on top of the cone they actually took 325 tons, lowered it down till they just touched the egg and you could not get the egg out, but they did not crack the egg. These guys are amazing. Well, it's got to be one of the most famous buildings, particularly when you talk about space in movies. And for more on that, here's Jenna Wood. Kennedy Space Center is home to the VAB, which has been the scene for many Hollywood motion pictures, including Armageddon and First Man. Here's a look at some other movies that have been filmed at the VAB and Kennedy Space Center. Launch control, Mr. Houston, we are go for launch. It's on the A-bomb if it blows. Somebody got a Swiss Army knife. Swiss Army knife? Are you kidding me? Well, so many great movies and the VAB a big part. What was your favorite space movie that you've seen so far? Well, it's uh, easy for me to answer because my favorite space movie also happens to be my favorite movie of all time, and that's The Right Stuff. The Right Stuff tells the story, starting with Chuck Yeager and how he broke the sound barrier, and then that transitions into the original Mercury 7 astronauts, and you find out how really cool they were and what they had to go through. And in fact, I to this day wear the official sunglasses that the Mercury 7 astronauts wear. You gotta look cool, that's the most important well, part. Well, that is the plan. I don't know if it works, but we always try. <laughs> well, and speaking of the original seven, the next generation of astronauts recently announced in uh, late 2018, and that's what's so exciting. The VAB won't be a part of the next story, but 2019, we're gonna start to see US-based spaceflight with manned uh, missions. Yeah, we're going to, to launch, that's the plan right now, is we're going to launch commercial crew astronauts on their commercial vehicles in 2019. 
This is huge because since 2011, we have had to rely upon the Russians and the Soyuz spacecraft in order to get them up to the International Space Station. We want to be self-reliant and we're developing in the commercial crew program, we're developing this capability which will allow us to take our own astronauts up to the International Space Station. But perhaps even more significantly at some point in the not too distant future, we'll be able to take private citizens. Once we have uh, certified them to take our astronauts, they are free to market that capability and take that to folks uh, anywhere in the world and you can take up academicians, you can take up tourists, you can take up scientists, anything you want and they can go up there and do their own experiments if they want. And what did some of the initial steps look like as far as getting some of the, the commercial crew program really moving? Well, what we've got to do is first we're going to each one of our providers, Boeing and SpaceX, each one of them are going to launch an uncrewed mission sometime hopefully in the next, uh, next few months. Once that happens, then they are cleared to go try and launch with a test flight, and this will actually have astronauts on board. They'll test the vehicle out. Once that's done, we go through, we sign off all the paperwork. This is, of course, a government thing. We have to sign our paperwork. And then they will be free to market that capability and to take our astronauts up to the National Space Station. And how cool will that be, not only to have astronauts go to outer space, but private citizens like you and me. Rocket Talk 2021, right from outer space. We've got to book it, right? That would be my plan. I'll tell you what I think is going to be really cool is, is once we take up a scientist, because right now the way the system works is if you're a scientist and you've got an experiment, you want to get on the space station, you take it and you, you build it into a box and you hand it to an astronaut. The astronaut does the experiment for you. If he has a problem, he's got to stop. He calls the scientist down on the ground. They talk about it. When you can take that scientist up and he can do it himself, the greatest discoveries in science come when you're doing an experiment and something goes wrong, you go, well, now that's interesting. And that's where real discovery can happen. And that's what we're trying to have happen. It's going to be really a, an incredible moment. And our man on the street, James, traveled around Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex to find out what the patrons knew about Space Shuttle Atlantis. Hello, I'm James. We're here at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. We're going to find out what people know about Space Shuttle Atlantis. I'm going to test your Atlantis knowledge. Uh, here's the first one for you. Oh, you can't hide over there. What year did the Atlantis first fly? Was it going to say around mid 80s? Mid 80s. If you're going to go right into the middle of the 80s, what would it be? 1985. 1985. 85? 1985. There you go. She's got it. Um, how many missions total did Atlantis fly? I'm not very sure. I thought it's in the 30s. I think around 35, maybe. It's 33, but you're very close, and you're very good on the camera. 33? 33. We've got all the information happening here. It's very informative and enlightening. What is the shuttle Atlantis named after? Okay, I'm going to go for the Lost City of Atlantis. Very good guess. Lost City of Atlantis is actually a seafaring vessel. There's so much here to learn at Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. History, education, it's worth coming by for a couple hours and checking out what you can learn. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, so many great historic moments happened with Space Shuttle Atlantis. What was your favorite memory? Well, first of all, when I first came to work for NASA, Atlantis was my orbiter. That's the one that I worked on. So naturally, uh, that's the one that, that I'm, I'm most uh, drawn to. My favorite mission, though, was, uh, was STS-98, which flew back in 2001. That took the Destiny Laboratory up to the International Space Station. It combined the, the two things that I most love, my space shuttle Atlantis, as well as I was mission manager for the Destiny Laboratory. So you combine those two things, and that, it's an easy choice for me. Yeah, pretty special. And of course, uh, take a look at so many of the astronauts and the, the history of NASA. So many astronauts really are the definition of what a hero is. When you think about what is a hero, what defines it for you? A hero is, is the way my way of thinking is he's selfless, he's brave, he's smart, and the very definition of that to me is Neil Armstrong. I grew up watching the Apollo program, and when Neil stepped on the moon, I could not have been prouder. Uh, I'm very fortunate in the course of my career. I got to meet Neil a couple of times. Uh, he is just the, the epitome of, of humble and smart. I mean, when, when he was done with walking on the moon, uh, he just wanted to go off and be an aerospace professor uh, up in Ohio. So uh, an incredibly classy man, very smart and extremely cool under pressure. And uh, folks who go see the movie First Man will understand exactly what I'm talking about. 
Well, so many heroes have launched right here from Cape Canaveral. Let's find out what defines being a hero. Courage, the ability to do something that frightens another. When you think of U.S. astronauts, the word courage doesn't stray too far behind. Mercury 7 astronauts went into space for the first time in our history without truly even knowing what the outcome would be. The Apollo program put men on the moon, showing that our courage has no boundaries. Our next generation of astronauts will go farther than anyone has gone before them in search of new worlds. No matter the risk, our astronauts continue to be courageous so humankind can continue to explore and discover. Courageous, heroic, valor, bravery. What does it take to be a hero? Experience heroes and legends at Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex and inspire the hero within you. Well, of course, there's going to be so many heroes and their journey is going to begin right here behind us with the VAB SLS going to be built in the next couple of years. And uh, it's special to think about that this building is going to continue its great legacy with NASA. Yeah, starting from when it was first built until now and into the future, this building has served so many purposes and, and worked wonderfully over all these years. Uh, they have stacked all the Apollo Saturn V's. Anybody who ever went to the moon, their vehicle was stacked right inside that building. Uh, for the shuttle program, every single vehicle was stacked inside that building. Uh, we have two big old high bays on the east side, we have two on the west side, although only one of them was ever used for uh, actually building up a Saturn V. Apollo 10 was stacked in one of the western high bays. Uh, but all the rest of them in the east and then rolled out to the launch pad. I love this building. It's iconic. Uh, it's the thing that dominates the landscape all around here. And the great news is the history of the VAB will continue as will our storytelling on Rocket Talk. That's going to do it for this episode. Make sure you like our channel and leave a question in the comments below. If you have any questions for any of our Rocket Talk crew and you want to check out our channel to find bonus features as well. For all of us here at Rocket Talk, I'm Bernie Gunther. We'll see you next time. I'm reading a book on anti-gravity, and Bernie, I can't put it down. <laughs> there you go. Want more Rocket Talk? Subscribe to our channel and be sure to check out our bonus features. Also, make sure to leave a comment so we can know what you'd like to see on an upcoming show.